But what we saw in the wake of Hamas's attack on October 7th was thousands and thousands and thousands of people in the streets of Western capitals celebrating, celebrating, shouting gas the Jews, jihad and all sorts of other things. Colson it's just marvellous to have some time with you again. Uh, it really is. We're here in London for ARC, the Alliance of Responsible Citizens. You gave a brilliant talk this morning, but the first thing I actually wanted to ask you about it was uh, you have uh, you know, real skills as a comedian. And what we saw this morning was that you, you used those skills to make powerful points. You've obviously thought a lot about how humour can be used to ram home great truths. I have, but first of all, let me say, John, this is the first of our meetings when I'm dressed smarter than you. So I, I've pulled one back for the team. You reckon you call that smarter than me? Yeah, absolutely. Velvet, come on. Yeah, no, well, I, I don't do velvet. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, no, you're right. Um, uh, I think I think it's a George Bernard Shaw quote. Uh, I think it was him who said, if you want to tell people the truth, make them laugh, otherwise they'll kill you. And I've, <laughs> I've always taken that rather to heart. So, yeah, I think, uh, look, uh, humor is a very powerful tool uh, and it's kind of a superpower and... Uh, particularly in this kind of environment where there are a lot of very serious people, people who've done important things. I, I haven't. I'm not that serious a person, but um, I can add humor and I hope that helps. Yeah, but you addressed very serious issues this morning. I mean, you made a very clever play of a horrific reality that we've thought for a long time. We've been worried uh, that uh, uh, the barbarians are at the gate. Uh, and you went on to say it's worse than that now. It was a very powerful way of making the point. Well, I think I think it's hard to argue after what we've seen in the last few weeks. I mean, there are people openly celebrating mass murder in our streets. I and mean, we shouldn't be confused about that. That is what happened. Uh, it's not the pro-Palestine rallies that we see now. People are allowed to be pro-Palestine. Of course, they are and vo voice their concerns about that issue. But what we saw in the wake of Hamas's attack on October 7th prior to any response from Israel, was thousands and thousands and thousands of people in the streets of Western capitals celebrating, celebrating, shouting gas the Jews, jihad, and all sorts of other things. Um, and so I think it's undoubtedly the case that we have let a lot of people into our countries who hate us and who hate our values and who will not hesitate to celebrate it when we're murdered. The uh, barbarians inside the gate, as you said. Now, you said that with a lot of feeling, and it moved a lot of people. Because by background, you understand that this has a long history. Uh, and the horrors of the Second World War, you know, it just struck me that during the horrors of, of, of what happened to the Jews during the Second World War, one thing about the Germans was that they had enough of a sense of shame to try and hide what they were doing. But we now have people in our own midst. They're not trying to hide it. They're boasting about it. We had, uh, you know, uh, 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 an Islamic leader in Australia who referred to tears of joy streaming down his face at what Hamas was doing. And uh, not to take the mood down even further, John, but I, I don't see how this gets better, do you? I mean... If we are going to continue to have an open border, which is what we have in this country, uh, allowing small boats to come in filled with people who do not go through checks, who do not go through any sort of identity verification, we don't know who they are, we don't know where they've come from, we don't know what type of people they are, we don't know what they want, then we're going to increase the population of people and some of them will be of this mindset. Um, and of course, there is no, absolutely no chance that we're going to be deporting any of them. We've seen that this week. The police, uh, it is, as of course you know, illegal in this country to incite violence uh, and to, to support prescribed terrorist organizations like Hamas. When supporters of Hamas were chanting jihad in the street and people reported this to, pol to the police on Twitter, <coughs> excuse me, the police responded by saying that jihad means many things, including in a struggle as if the people in the street are chanting jihad in that way. So it's very difficult to see how this gets better. That's a very challenging proposition, but perhaps it might start with people's, the forgotten people of your life, you know, the, 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 the huge numbers of citizens who feel alienated in their own land and have been worried 
about losing their identity and losing their freedoms, starting to focus on what undergirds those freedoms and what our values are, that's what ARC's been about, so that we can build something more durable. We can say some things can be tolerated, but some cannot if we're going to have a community that works, that's settled, that's free, that's prosperous. Well, that's all very nice. Um, I don't see that reflected in the political system that we have. We have had in this country a, a, a right-wing government for 13 years that have overseen this thing get worse and worse. And <clears throat> I mean, look at, we saw it only a couple of weeks ago in Brussels, there was a terrorist attack, a man who shot two Swedish football fans to death. Uh, this was somebody who came via Lampedusa, a small island in Italy. His asylum claim was denied in 2020. He was known to the authorities to be a jihadi. He was not deported and he went on to kill two people. Um, are we going to have governments that take care of that problem? Who do we work for in this country to take care of that problem? Who do, who do people in Australia work for? You tell me. Where are the political leaders who are going to address this issue? So <laughs> I am temperamentally extremely optimistic about uh, everything. Uh, but on this particular issue, I, sh I, would I, I put this point that I'm putting to you now, and I'm sorry to depress you and your audience, to very senior people who've been in government, who've been in politics, and none of them have an answer. How is this going to get better? Maybe you can tell me. I don't have any easy answers. I'm certainly uh, here in London, part of ARC, instead of simply being retired and put out to pasture on my own fat, um, because I care, because I recognise it's very important. Because I don't think you can find an answer in the democracies, at least in light and totalitarian regimes, but in the democracies, you can't if you don't stir, if you like middle America, middle Britain, middle Australia, the citizens who in many ways have been satiated by great materialism uh, and, if you like, to be frank, probably brainwashed by a lot of deconstructionism in our universities that spilled out into the broader community, leaving them feeling that our culture is not worth defending, that our culture is the problem. Right. We shouldn't defend it. So surely what you're doing is an important start. You're out there speaking very powerfully, saying we need to wake up and we've got to re-engage those good people who perhaps have just hoped forlornly that someone would come along. Yes, and I think the, I mean, if you want to look for good news is, the good news is the vast majority of the public agree with us. Uh, we had a poll in the last couple of weeks which shows that in this country, 92% of conservative voters and 70% of Labour voters, which surprised me actually, <coughs> believe we should be deporting people who glorify terrorism. Um, we have a government that won't though. So uh, it is only a, a change of the political system that will eventually create this. Uh, but you're right. I mean, I think Douglas Murray and myself and many other people have been saying what I think needs to be said in this moment. Let's hope that translates into some kind of political change. Now, let's be fair, Kurt. You have seen some politicians at least try and find some solutions. They reach and very, very quickly run into all sorts of uh, problems, what might be called, <laughs> broadly speaking, the new elites. Now, we always have to have leaders. We'll always have to have bureaucracies. We'll always have to have courts. But perhaps increasingly they've been those, those positions have been peopled by individuals who don't have a great respect for the values of the broader community and will frustrate governments well i frustrate i think the narrative among those people is that the people can't be trusted yeah that's uh, what i'm driving at. yeah the people can't be trusted the people are suspect morally and ethically and therefore to follow uh, the wishes of the people is to engage in xenophobia and racism and prejudice, which, of course, is very silly. I think uh, you probably find that among immigrant communities, support for legal immigration and enforcement of the border is actually quite high. I mean, I'm a first generation immigrant. I don't see why my mother, as happened, who applied to come to Britain and visit her grandson, should be denied her visa application. And yet somebody can come and get in a boat and, and come to this country. That, that doesn't seem to make sense to me. So, yes, I think um, we interviewed a guy called Steve Hilton, who was a, a former advisor to David Cameron. Uh, I, I met him in a, in a bar in Utah. 
and uh, we went for a drink, it became 10 drinks. And the stories he was telling me about attempting to get things through the civil service, I mean, they, they make Yes Minister look like an understatement of what's going on. It really is, it seems to be very difficult to deliver on, on the commitments made by politicians to the electorate because people in the civil service seems to think they know better. You did give some thoughts on how academics business people who can see the problems might push back against wokeness. Mm. Can you well, elaborate I, a little on what do you... I, I hope by the time this interview goes out, people have seen the speech because I won't be able to reproduce it uh, with quite as much humour uh, as I did there. Uh, but yes, I mean, for, for business people, I think uh, we have to take ourselves at our word. If we think this problem is as bad as it is, then... If you have a fortune that you've accumulated, I said in the speech, there can be no greater return on your investment than protecting our civilization. Um, to academics, look, it, it's very difficult in the education sector. They feel like you know, partisans behind enemy lines, as I said. Um, but they've got to keep going. They've got to keep going. Um, in the media, we have plenty of work to do and there's plenty we can do. I, I think actually new media is the one thing that is exciting in terms of opportunities. It's an opportunity to shift the narrative and to set the agenda. And, to, and for politicians, it's very clear to me that the stories we've been discussing here at ARC and the narratives and culture, these things are very important. But it's very, very difficult to persuade young people to believe in conserving a society that does not work for them. And um, I was at a Peter Thiel lecture in Oxford a few days ago. He made this point. Douglas Myers has been making this point. I've been making this point. Young people don't have a stake in their society. It's difficult. It's very, very difficult. I'm 40. It's difficult for my generation to get on the housing ladder. Uh, it's difficult to buy or even rent a house that's big enough to have a family in. Um, and when you have that sort of situation, you have to be honest and say, why on earth would young people be conservative? And that's my message to conservatives always from day one. I think we talked about this in the very first interview you did with me. I've been saying this for years. Yeah, I understand that. Uh, and I, I really genuinely understand it. I'm not making light of it. Mm. Uh, as someone who was in a government that was economically reformist, uh, and which sought to balance budgets because the best youth policy, as our former treasurer Peter Costello has commented, actually is debt reduction. So that you don't pass on massive debts with the crippling taxes that go with them to service them because governments don't have debts, only people do. Mm. Um, I can understand the sense of disillusion that it's been made worse by poor economic responses to the great financial crisis, which shouldn't have happened. No one went to jail. It was technically no one had broken the law. Did they behave immorally? Did they behave in ways that reflected that capitalism had lost its moral compass? Yes. Was the damage great? Yes. It was exacerbated by COVID. And here's the rub, because of all things, this is the one that young people probably are not sort of tuned into. The sort of responses that we are forming to climate Insane. are damaging the fabric even more because there are wealthy people insulated from it. But the costs, and there are real costs, come against middle and lower income earners and young people. Now, the great problem we've got here, though, is to some extent an intellectual one, it's not a conservative versus left versus right, it's how we actually get the fundamentals of sound economics over it. It's, in the end, it's no different to running a house. Run your budget properly, you'll be able to afford things. If you don't, you'll come unstuck. Well, from your lips to our government's ears, uh, I have been wondering aloud for a very long time now, long before I became a pub public figure in any way, how it is possible that we are accumulating debts. I mean, the United States' interest repayments next year will be greater than their defense budget. Yeah. I am no great economist. That does not seem to me to be sustainable. And it is not sustainable. It is not. And as a father who hopes to one day be a grandfather like you, I don't see the morality in passing down these debts to our children and grandchildren. And by the way, this is where I think we, we really have struggled and we have to start doing better is we have struggled to win the linguistic argument and language is very important in the way we communicate about these issues the progressive woke 
ideas are constantly presented by those people who advocate them as being about compassion and empathy. And we have to start winning the argument on their terms and saying there is nothing compassionate about impoverishing our children and grandchildren. There is nothing compassionate about middle class posh people driving into London or taking trains into London to glue themselves to roads to stop working class people getting to the job that pays for their children to have food on the table. There's nothing empathetic or compassionate about impoverishing poor people around the world so that we can feel good about the fact that we've reduced Britain's global carbon emissions percentage from 2% to 1% or even to zero. There's nothing compassionate about that. It's not empathetic. It's, it's a religion uh, that is demanding things of us that make no sense. It's a sort of Aztec human sacrifice almost in the way that they're approaching these things. They make no sense. And increasingly, the public are starting to understand that that's what's happening. You have seen the ugliness of societies that are not democratic. We run the danger of so undermining confidence in our own model that not only are we looking at internal decay and degeneration, autocrats everywhere can see that and are trading on it. They've, they're sniffing blood in the water. And I've, you and I have had this conversation many times, but... <clears throat> Of all the many accusations you could level at Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, they're not stupid men, neither of them. They understand what is in their interest. And uh, as we signal weakness, my concern is given how indebted we are, you know, the problem with signaling weakness and internal division is that, you know, Pax Americana, the global world order that we've had to this point, it relied on everybody accepting America's dominance. But if you signal weakness over and over and over again, you will find yourself where you find yourself now. Iran, Russia, China increasingly working together. And while America remains the greatest power in the world and combined with her allies, uh, the greatest alliance in the world, I don't think that's an alliance that can take on three, four, five, seven, ten, twenty threats at once. It is precisely... The point of signaling strength and being strong is precisely to prevent these things from emerging. I mean, I, every time you and I speak, I feel like I'm telling you things that you already know because you you understand this very well. I mean, there's nothing controversial or odd about what I'm saying. It's It's very basic things that people on the playground know, frankly. If you are perceived as weak, you will be bullied. And if you're perceived as strong, people will leave you alone. It, it's really that simple. So how do we then encourage, because there must be, potential jurors out there in a country like Britain in a country like America the sort of people who have the courage and the leadership you know to step up in an age of cancel culture how do we encourage them to do it any thoughts I had an incredible plea at the end of, the <coughs> of your talk uh, you know how dare we obliterate your son's future you got a young son you know, one on the way as we talk uh, not yet, but we'll, we'll get there. Ah, sorry. I'm working on it. Yeah, right. Good on it. Yeah, well, well, good luck with that. Thank you. But are you at all uh, hopeful that in an age of cancel culture, when the disincentives for standing up and being courageous are so massive, we could find the leadership we need again? Look, John, I'm going to say this very crudely, but you're Australian, so you'll you'll let me. People need to strap on a pair. They really do. Uh, I mean, look, yes, cancel culture is a problem and uh, and has been, but also we've got to a point where I feel like we have enough new media organizations like mine and uh, enough various groups and things that, you know, if you get canceled, it's not really that bad anymore. Yeah. You might even do quite well out of it, frankly. So... We need more people to be courageous, to realize that you've only got one life and there's no point living it in, in fear. There's no point cowering. There's no point bending the knee to people with whom you disagree. And we as citizens actually have to stop punishing people who speak the truth. This has been happening for a long time. The moment anyone in politics says something that most people know to be true, all it takes is for The Guardian or some other left-wing paper to run some headlines 
and everybody suddenly is bending over backwards, pretending or they're, they're horrified by, you know, somebody who said something. Um, it, it, normal people need to say enough and they need to vote for people who are speaking the truth and to reward people for speaking the truth. And the more that happens, the more people will be incentive. I mean, you know, there's people who respond to incentives. If we incentivize truth speaking, if we incentivize people making difficult decisions, I mean, the deficit, which we just talked about, uh, is a very good example of this. The moment anyone attempts to cut our spending, they're immediately told that they are being cold and callous and cruel. Uh, and we have to win that argument. It is not cold and callous and cruel to consider the interests of our children and grandchildren over reducing our spending by 1%. I understand that has a negative impact on people. I really do. But we have been living beyond our means. And the person who comes along and tells us that honestly, unapologetically, unapologetically, they will have the majority of the country behind them. Well, congratulations on your understanding of the problems, the perspective you're bringing, the courage uh, that you're exhibiting in bringing these things out into the public arena. Uh, I think you're going to be with us in Australia at some stage in the not too distant future. Uh, and I think you'll be very, very welcome indeed. We look forward to it. Great to see you again, John. Thank you.